Welcome everyone. So, I'm here to talk about MultiB. Uh, we actually have a fair number of uh, MultiB engineers here today. Myself, Ning, Ariel, and John Pico is actually the VP of Engineering. So, we can certainly answer any technical questions you have. Uh, the title of this talk, actually, I, I uh, honestly, I forgot this was the title of the talk. I made a title slide and I just went and made the talk and plugged the computer in and there it was again. So, if anybody wants to try to uh, help make sense out of the title and open to suggestions. So I guess we have these books to give away. Um, haven't thought of criteria for that yet. I wonder, is, has anyone here used VoltDB? Has anyone built an app with VoltDB? <laughs> <laughs> of course, Tim doesn't count. <laughs> for uh, employees that be for a book? <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, has anyone heard of VoltDB? <laughs> all right, that's good, that's good. Um, has anyone, how many people here heard Tim's talk when he gave it about Volt? I'm not nearly as entertaining as Tim, so you should prepare for disappointment right now. Alright, so we're going to talk about uh, three basic things today, and we're going to leave a lot of time. You can interrupt me at any point you want with questions. I'm really hoping to have more of a conversation than a straight ahead presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about the motivation for a system like Volt. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the details and the features that make Bolt unique. And, uh, and then once I've done the easy part of just reciting what's on the slide, we're going to bring Ming up, and he's actually going to build a small Bolt app for us while we watch. Uh, so hopefully that'll be interesting, and I think it uh, should be an interesting way to try to understand the system a little bit better than just from slides. So motivation. So there's kind of these two tiers of, of data management systems these days, right? There's the legacy kind of relational systems. They have uh, often single node, got the ACID transactions that we're very familiar with. And there's the NoSQL solutions, which really focus more on being cloud deployable. They distribute data. They usually replicate data with the idea that they're running on low reliability hardware. Uh, and they replicate data also specifically for availability. Um, because of all of that replication and the desire for availability, they often give up certain transactional semantics. And they really focus on a low cost profile. Right? They, the idea that each transaction, each interaction with the database is cheap. So you're, you're running kind of frequent things on cheaper hardware. But there's really a lot of use cases that want to pick and choose from these two columns. They want a little bit from A and a little bit from B. And what we're finding is we talk to people about OLTB is that a lot of people who have interest in Volt have that kind of pick and choose mentality about what they want. Specifically, they're looking for a lot of the transactional semantics that a relational system gives them, but they're looking for some of the cloud, de cloud deployability and some of the, the cost profile and scalability of a NoSQL system. So there's kind of a matrix here of, of some of the cases, some of the different vertical markets we've spoken to people with or people are using VoltDB in. And in a little bit of a, that's not what I intended, a little bit of an example of some of the parts of their use case that are challenging and, and why mixing and matching between sort of the legacy relational systems and the more uh, newer, newcomer, NoSQL systems are interesting to them. So if you look, for example, at financial trade monitoring, uh, people are consuming large tick streams of data. Uh, they want to maintain state against that tick stream, right? So they need to be able to consume tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or more uh, incoming transactions per second and do heavy write update workloads on that. Uh, and at the same time, while they're consuming uh, that big incoming stream of tick data, they want to be able to do transactional consistent aggregates across it. They want to know, for example, uh, what's my risk by trading desk, right? So if they have an algorithm that's producing trades in a market, if you're a, an automated trading system, you want to know how are my algorithms comparing against each other. You may want to know across all of the algorithms, what's my exposure to a certain stock or to a certain sector of stocks. And so that really requires that you can consume an incoming tick stream, a really challenging write workload, and at the same time produce uh, a consistent transactional query against to say a multi-key query, right? So if you would partition this against the NoSQL system, some kind of a distributed hash table-like system, here you want to read across keys or across documents, right? If you like that terminology better. Uh, the same kind of thing happens with uh, telco call detail records. People are monitoring incoming call records and they're looking for fraud patterns. Uh, fraud is a, 
kind of a common theme here, and that people are often consuming some kind of near real-time data, and near the origin, sort of the temporal origin of that data, they want to do an analysis to look for patterns that indicate abuse or fraud or some kind of an excess of a threshold that's been set for a business reason. <clears throat> Website analytics is another good example. Uh, in this case, you're, you're tracking uh, maybe ticks. You're looking at what part of your, your system, which part of your uh, architecture is being interacted with. You may be uh, doing essentially impression counting, right? Like, plus one buttons, like buttons, all of these things are just big counting problems where it's important that you can count accurately and quickly. The data being generated is massive. And at the same time, you want to be able to take that counting that you've done, do a quick analysis of it, and turn it back around so that you can affect the presentation layer, so that you can say, hey, you know, if your friends clicked on this five times, they must like it. I want to show you this ad too. Right? So it's another example where you have a really high throughput right workload, the counting of these different impressions, and then you want to turn that back into a quick analysis and a redisplay for the next person. Anyway, this kind of goes on. Uh, I think the point I'm, the overriding point here is that you want, these systems all involve counting, right? They all involve uh, the ability to increment, which is an atomic read and write. Right? And so they need the fundamental uh, transactionality of to do that, at the same time, they really have to scale rights. Right? These are all recording an incoming stream of facts and a high rate stream, so they need to be able to scale to that right workload. I have a couple more detailed examples. Uh, so here's an example where an advertising company is uh, doing essentially a real-time auction to display web ads. and they have a couple of business rules that they need to follow. They need to be able to serve ads according to the contracts they've signed, right, to the, to the lots of ads that they've sold to people. And at the same time, they want to be able to essentially kind of compose ads in real time, right? So they want to go kind of mix and match and build an ad uh, in near the real time of someone having looked at it or viewed it before. And they want to A-B test the different ads that they're composing. Right? So again, in this case, they need to measure the interactions with that ad which can be a large number of incoming writes. Uh, right? Again, recording how people are, are using that data and, and recording the data that's generated from that. And then they need to be able to look across those ads, across keys, and make sort of a consistent judgment. Right? They need to be able to implement the business logic that can do a transaction that involves multiple keys and can read those keys consistently. One of the earliest uh, strong proponents of VoltDB was building, is building an online game. And uh, he's a really passionate person, he's fun to talk to, and he really bugs him that so many big multiplayer games shard their universes. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the idea that you have a bunch of players that are artificially segregated from one another simply because you can't build a system that can scale uh, to hold them all. all right, so you end up playing the same game, but you know, you're on server one and, and someone else is on server two and those two people can't interact. But in this case, he sees uh, Volt is a way to get the performance that he needs to achieve the scaling that he needs to build the user experience that he desires. Uh, and so here's a little bit of a different example where you could solve a problem maybe by sharding something, uh, more like a legacy system. But once it's sharded, you have to deal with it. Uh, uh, I understand that there are people who solve this problem in other ways. but. But it, it many times, once you've sharded a system, right, you have to deal with it as a series of, of independent entities. Right? And he really wants to deal with it as a holistic whole. He wants one database, not many separate databases. And so he's looking for the ability to record a really high velocity incoming stream of data and then manage it kind of in a consistent single DBMS. So I mentioned fraud a little bit. Here's another case that's essentially fraud related. Uh, there's a person using VoltDB uh, to do network monitoring. So they run an ISP and they collect statistics about all of the endpoints in the, in the network that they expose or that they manage. And they need to be able to look for uh, denial of service trends against those endpoints. Uh, so they need to be able to take logs essentially from lots of different endpoints. They need to be able to bring them to a central location. And then they need to look for trends. And they need to do all of this you know, within a 
a portion of a second, right? A fraction of a second, 500 milliseconds, right? So they have a, a budget of time that's kind of measured in seconds in order to do the detection and then to take whatever business logic they need to do as a result of the detection of an attack. That's a lot of talking for me. So are there, are there any questions? Does people have any other comments or any other use cases like this that they see? Or is this, a, am, I, am I relating to things that, yeah? You did great. You, you started out by uh, saying the third is SQL and non-SQL database, relational versus non-SQL. Um, and then you said that it's new on all the keys that you choose. But you didn't go into which you call me, which you call me. Yeah. <clears throat> Is that excellent? Indeed. Okay. I think in two slides, but yes. Uh, thank you. That's, uh, so I guess this is just another, another quick summary before I, I answer your question. Uh, there's another way to look at this. We've looked at the, the previous slides, look at this by sort of transaction profile. There's another way to look at this problem, and that's kind of by relationship to where data is originated and how you process data with respect to how old it is. Right? And what we've seen is there's, I, your Twitter example I think is a, is a perfect case where there's this huge incoming tweet stream, right? lots of data, and there's some questions that you want to ask of that tweet stream near the point of origin, right? Like as it's being generated, there's certain natural questions to ask. What's trending now, right? Is, is it the easiest example? Hashtag counting. Another, right, another case where you simply need to be able to accurately count an incoming stream or details from an incoming stream. And there's other questions that you ask of data once it's slightly older, right? And then there's other questions that you ask of data that might be substantially old. And in, in our current world, you know, New data might be milliseconds old, and really old data might be five minutes old, right? So it's not necessarily data that's a year or two old when I say old data. And so I think that a lot of people uh, are moving towards the idea of building a data processing pipeline where near sort of the, the origin of data, when data is first appearing to them, they want something that in this diagram is called a velocity engine. Uh, the V for velocity and the V for volt might have some relationship, I think, with this picture. And, and they want something that can consume the stream of data, they can perform some kind of business logic against it, some kind of fraud detection or thresholding or business logic enforcement, or maybe it's sensor data that's really messy. Maybe you have sensors that produce duplicate readings. You need to perhaps aggregate your data so that it can be efficiently loaded into an OLAP system. You want to batch it somehow. This is a, a common workflow, and anybody that has a huge web frontier, right? They, they gather logs at all of their all of their web servers, and they batch those and feed them into some kind of an analytic system. People are doing this sort of processing more and more and more in real time, right? What used to take even really uh, clever companies like Facebook maybe 12 hours to process from an interaction at the front of their website to redisplay back to another user they can now do in under a minute, right? And they're doing it by building these kinds of pipelines, by putting sophisticated counting engines close to the origin of the data, by using those engines to uh, produce aggregates or, or summaries or batches that can be really efficiently ingested into another analytic system for long-term storage. And then, in Facebook's case, put back into a MySQL tier so that it can be served back to the, to the front end right for the next web visitor. And this is the same pattern that appears over and over again in all the different verticals in that previous slide. So why is this pattern interesting? Right? Why, why, these, why the mixture of, of new and old here? Well, uh, it's fundamentally a counting problem, and it's a scaling problem. And to be able to count, you need transactionality, you need atomic access to data, you need isolation, right? You basically need acid. And to do this efficiently against a really high velocity stream of data, you need to be able to move processing to the data. You can't be pulling large documents of data back from a client application to the database, right? It's just too much data to be shoving back and forth over the network. So you need to move the processing to the data. You need to be able to scale out, right? These are workloads that can't be achieved on a single machine. They need to be achieved on a cloud of machines. And 
Since you want to run these things often in the cloud, you need some kind of an architecture that's cloud friendly. You need an architecture that replicates naturally so that you can suffer the common failures of hardware in the cloud. Uh, and you also often are using these in some kind of a, a, a web or something that eventually faces UI, and so availability becomes important, right? Some of these are simply batch processing. Availability can be traded there. Many of these things are not. Maybe these are critical business activities that require high availability. So there's a number of products that have kind of kind of started to filter into this niche. And the new SQL term was actually coined by an analyst of the 451 group to cover a bunch of vendors that were sort of building things in this area. Uh, it's really interesting to see what these vendors have in common and what they don't. Uh, the techniques that people use to get sort of the scale and the concurrency are really different. So VaultDB uses a transactional procedure API. So in VaultDB, a stored procedure and a transaction are one and the same thing. And VaultDB serializes transactions, which gives you uh, isolation. And in each transaction, each procedure has relatively exclusive access to data while it's running, which gives you a lot of consistency. Uh, other systems have built uh, MVCC systems. Other people are building uh, alternate storage engines for MySQL. And then there are people who are building uh, kind of like sharding front ends in, in, in front of other systems. There's lots of approaches to this. There's also a lot of commonalities between these. Most of them uh, expose SQL as their query language. They have asset transactions that are very familiar to relational users. They all have some kind of uh, fancy concurrency control for performance. And they all have some way to scale out horizontally. Uh, but the, so, so those are sort of the, the similarities of relational systems that you might be familiar with. They also have similarities with the NoSQL. So this is the column B, right? What do you want from column B? Well, you need to be cloud friendly, right? You need to be able to scale out horizontally. And really importantly, you need to have a low cost per transaction profile, right? So per node performance is important here. You want to be able to run these things on uh, more than one machine, but not necessarily thousands, right? You want to reduce operational cost. And often the value of any one transaction in this system, doesn't have, there's not a strong financial value associated with a single transaction. Right? A single transaction is maybe only making you a fraction of a penny. So it can't cost you pennies to process it, right? It's, the stream is important in aggregate, and there's a financial value in aggregate, but any particular transaction doesn't represent a large financial win for having processed it. So it needs to be very cheap to process each transaction. Did I, that, that was my column A, column B part of this talk. Did I answer the question or sufficiently? OK. So uh, usually when I hear talks like this and I see a bunch of slides, the first question I ask myself is, does it work? <laughs> is, it, is it reasonable? And I mean, so we can show you, we're going to show you a demo of Volt today. I can, I can speak a little bit to some of the performance that Volt specifically achieves. And I'm sure that other people can speak to the performance of their other systems. Uh, so there was a vault based upon some research that was done by a bunch of academics whom no one's ever heard of. And uh, they, that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> All right, but anyway, so the, in the academic work that they did, they built a prototype of sort of the transaction system that Volt's built on, this idea of running a series of stored procedures serially against a processing engine. And they compared this versus uh, a more legacy style database. And they produced a drastic difference in throughput on uh, TPCC. So they could do 1,700 new orders, having turned off uh, logging and epsyncing, right, just pure in memory on the, on the legacy system. And when they moved that same workload into memory in a VoltDB, or on the prototype that eventually sort of morphed into VoltDB, they were able to do uh, 46,000 some transactions a second. So we What's that? TPCC like. Yeah, TPCC like. Yeah. Ariel's usually have the pedantic one around. So hey, this is an apples to apples comparison. It's the same workload run against both systems. Um, it doesn't qualify as a real TPCC implementation. So I don't want any TPCC zealots chasing me down in the middle of the night. Uh, so anyway, VoltDB can do a million SQL statements per second on a node. 
It can do between 50 and 180,000 real transactions per second on a node. The VoltDB is fast. It can do a lot of work. Uh, and so, I mean, if you're trying to be uh, swayed that this is real, uh, I don't know that a slide with numbers on it is any more persuasive than the slides that preceded it, but we're happy to talk about performance and we're happy to talk about uh, specific combinations of, of workloads and what that means to performance in Volt. I want to talk a little bit about VoltDB's features. I, I know that Tim has talked at length about uh, VoltDB and that there's other recorded talks that talk a lot about stored procedures and, and about some of the internal architecture of Volt. Uh, I can also speak to that or, or any of the four of us can speak to that if there's questions here today. I'm going to look at a slightly higher level of this for this overview. Uh, so, kind of, what is Volt? Well, Volt's really fundamentally about two things. It's about performance and it's about transactions. Uh, so, how, why is Volt performant? Well, one thing that makes Volt fast is it does all of its calculations against data by storing the full amount of data in RAM. So, it's an in-memory system for calculation. Uh, Volt is written to have a highly scalable network I.O. model. It, can, it actually appreciates very high levels of concurrent clients. It prefers it if you have clients to keep it busy. Uh, VaultDB writes data to disk for durability, thanks to ARIA. And uh, all of that work is done with sequential I.O. So there aren't random reads and writes in Volt's uh, I.O. disk system. Uh, so essentially what makes Volt fast is that the user creates a set of stored procedures. Those procedures are like an API to their data, right? They're, the work that they want to do. And in almost all of these stream processing applications, very few of the queries that run against the database are typed in by an operator at a terminal. Right? They're all driven by some kind of an application. They're all driven by middleware. And so you can essentially build a database application that matches to the API that your middleware requires. And in VaultDB, you, you implement a set of stored procedures that do that. That middleware application invokes the procedures, it bundles them up, and it serializes them across TCP IP to the database, which deserializes them, and then routes them to the appropriate partition. So VoltDB shards data across the nodes in a cluster. It does that uh, relatively transparently to the user. And, and then each partition receives the procedures that it's supposed to run, and it serializes them in a deterministic order. And then each partition can process those procedures independently from the other partitions in the system. So uh, essentially, VoltDB replaces uh, a lot of the overhead of a, of a buffer cache, a lot of the overhead of, of logging, a lot of, a lot of these overheads with an overhead of scheduling procedures and partitions. And it can schedule those, part those procedures relatively efficiently, right? enough to do 100,000 procedures per node if they're you know, arriving that fast. So, VoltDB is also about transactions. So each, each stored procedure of VoltDB is a fully isolated, durable, consistent transaction. And you can have multiple SQL statements within a procedure. Uh, and within a single partition procedure, you can roll back an arbitrary point in that procedure and then continue like you would expect. So you can have transaction control kind of within a procedure. And in general, whether it's a single part or multi-part procedure, a procedure that requires data at just one partition or at all partitions in the system, the procedure either happens in its entirety or not at all. Right. So it's a transaction. Uh, you can also write complex stored procedures in, in, in VoltDB. So a VoltDB stored procedure is just a chunk of Java code that uses SQL statements for data access and uses Java for flow control or for business logic. Right? You can therefore write, you have all the power of kind of Java at your fingertips. So you can write relatively complex business logic in a store procedure, and you can move a lot of processing close to data. So it is not like a Java driver, it's much closer than that? Does it look like a Java driver? Yeah. Uh, so you can invoke stored procedures over a JDBC interface. Uh, but the procedure itself is just uh, a Java class with a run method. And then that run method queues SQL statements with parameters provided when the procedure was invoked. It gets their results back as whole tables, just our table API. You can read the data out of that table, do whatever logic you want in Java, 
few more SQL statements or roll back the procedure or return an array of tables to the client. It's kind of the workflow of the whole procedure. And you can invoke those procedures over a number of different drivers or wire, or, or wire protocol implementations. There's drivers written in, uh, there's an native Java driver, there's a JDBC driver, there's a C Sharp driver, Python driver. C++. There's a couple of C++ drivers. Node.js. Oh yeah, there's a Node.js driver, which we're excited about. Uh, it's a lot of fun to play with. And um, I probably missed a couple. Erlang. Oh yeah, there's an Erlang driver. And I think there was a Ruby driver, maybe for a while, I don't remember. Anyway, there's a lot of ways to interact with the database. And Ning is going to show us some of them shortly. Uh, so, so MultiB is, is fundamentally an in-memory system. It stores all of the data in memory. And whenever you mention that, people immediately ask questions about durability. So I'm just going to show the durability slide quickly after the in-memory slide. Uh, there's a number of features in Vol related to availability and durability. So, VoltDB replicates data within a cluster to a user-configured replication factor. In Volt, that replication factor is called your k-safety factor. Uh, and this is synchronous. So we don't reply to a client or to, a, to an end user until data has been replicated and committed at all surviving, currently surviving partitions in the system. Uh, also relatively new in beta, coming out of beta shortly, is an asynchronous inter-cluster replication. So you can replicate an entire database to another VoltDB instance. This is a, a read-only replica. Uh, so as the database completes work, as essentially the, the primary database completes work, at, bundles that work, and ships over the procedures that need to be run to a replica cluster, where the work is done again in the same order to get the same <coughs> result. Uh, and then that replica cluster is also available for offloading reads. So this is a full database replication. Now those are more on the availability side. On the durability side, VoltDB can produce consistent point in time snapshots. So you can send a transaction that says write all your data to disk. And the system essentially puts all of the tables in the system in a copy on write mode and begins sort of lazily writing that data to disk. Uh, and uh, you can do this on a schedule, so you can tell the database to snapshot yourself every n minutes, and it will do so. Uh, or there's a command logging feature, uh, which is uh, essentially a log of all of the stored procedure invocations that arrive at the system. So the snapshot obviously will, will have all of the data from one point in time back, but from the time that you initiated that snapshot to the present point in time, right? there's, there's data that hasn't been written anywhere. So the command log covers that data. The period of that time, that period of time can be also written to disk as stored procedure invocations arrive, those procedures are, are logged. And that command log can be configured to be synchronous, meaning that the system will f-sync the, the log that's been done before it executes the transaction. Or it can be asynchronous, right? And the user can control the f-sync rate. They can kind of trade off the performance durability sort of matrix. Um, what do you do in, if one of the nodes in your replications in your replica set is down? Yeah, so if one of the nodes in the replica set is down, um, the system notices the down node, it resolves the topology to not include that node, and if a full set of data in the system is still available, so if at least one instance of every partition is available, the system continues operation. So how do you handle when it comes back in terms of some of the eventual consistency options that no single database is used? Yeah, so when you rejoin a node back to Bolt, it essentially connects to the database, it selects the partitions that it's going to re-replicate, and it streams the data from those replicas to itself. And then it, the database continues normal operation. So there's no concept of a quorum? No, Volt is always uh, either available or unavailable. There's not a concept of partial availability of data in Volt. Um, there is another feature in Volt that you can you can tell the system that if it's partitioned exactly in half, uh, you can enable a partition detection feature, which will cause uh, one half, which we call the blessed half, to remain alive, and the second half will always terminate itself. So you can you can stop split brain if you have an exact 50-50 split of the database. But in VoltDB, if the system is available, then all data is available and all data is consistent. It's a strongly consistent system. 
And so where it has to trade availability for consistency, it does so. Yeah, um, so it's a, every, it's, a, it's a peer system, so a multi-master system. All of the nodes in Volt are, are equal to one another, uh, and all of the different copies of a partition in Volt have essentially the same function in the system. So, yes, they share a consistent topological view, except when they're resolving failure, and then they exchange information until they re-achieve a consistent state. And then they resume processing transactions. Is that a special protocol? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that protocol is essentially a multi-B specific protocol. Yeah. That, No, you, you, you point it to a leader node, essentially. So here's a node in the cluster, attaches to that node, that node sends it the rest of the topology information, essentially a snapshot of the topology information, and, and a set of partitions that it should, uh, uh, I anthropomorphize a lot, which some people criticize. It. The new node receives essentially the set of partitions to replicate, and then it establishes network connections to the hosts in the system that have that partitions data, and it begins the replication process. Is it random or is it the lowest one? Oh, so you're talking about for consistency to check that they don't diverge. Mm -hmm. so, so we don't ever allow them to diverge. So writes always go to all the replicas and reads always go to all the replicas. And the result of that read is compared. Okay. So um, it just makes one random or is it both based? Uh, you mean, you mean during the rejoin specifically or during transact normal transaction processing? Oh. So during rejoin, it, it picks one at random. It, it, it doesn't really matter no. as far as I know because it's uh, hopefully on a kind of frequent operation. So in normal operation, though, all, all partitions see all transactions, both reads and writes. Uh, reads are performed everywhere, results are brought back to. Uh, to wherever the transaction was originated, to whatever transaction manager essentially created the transaction, and results are compared for consistency. So I think it's... About your reads, uh, if you take so much precaution on using writes, that writes go everywhere, why would you do reads not everywhere? Mostly just paranoia. <laughs> well, you can have silent failures on notes. ECC can fail, and that's yeah. not necessarily your failure to write it. It's failure on notes itself. So, there's... There's not a lot to be gained by doing the read only in one place. Uh, most of the things people are having a hard time scaling in Volt are write based, so the write's the challenging workload. And so doing the replicating the reads is, is not a substantial overhead. Although we do have people who ask us to not replicate reads because yeah, that's they want to. Why would you let you find any uh, and so, so we do it now because we care a lot about consistency and we want to be able to compare the results on an ongoing basis. Um, but it is somewhat of an arbitrary choice. We could choose to do that only at one replica. And you know, if someone had an application that required that for performance reasons, it's it's a little bit of an arbitrary choice, but it hasn't hurt so far. And it's not tunable. It's not currently tunable. No. We try to keep things in bold not horribly. We try to tune not. There are things that are important to be tuned that are tunable in the system, but uh, we try to keep it kind of a simple, straightforward system to use as well. Do you have code samples? You mentioned Java client or some other uh, client programs calling code. I didn't hear the first part of your question. Do you have code samples to use later on? Yeah, we do. And we can show some code samples when we when we get to that. Sure. When it, we're actually when the next slide is actually question and answer, so we're in the right part. <laughs> yes, please. I'm sorry. Uh, when you're talking about a snapshotting on the previous slide before this one, mm -hmm. um, are you talking about within the database sort of as a like a archive redo log, or are you talking about snapshotting 
as for backup, as in taking a full, consistent. It's a know, full, consistent time. serialization of all the tuple data in the system. Okay, and is that using like FS freeze or XFS or ZFS or? Uh, no, the user can pick their file system of choice, but we don't use any. We don't use any uh, file system snapshot of the whole function. Okay, so how are you getting a consistent? Because essentially we uh, uh, have a transaction that represents the point in time at which the snapshot begins. And if data is changed by a future transaction that has not yet been written to disk, a copy is made in memory. So it does like a little bit of, of uh, like multi-version concurrency, tiny little bit. Okay. Yes? An easier question. Is it designed for like an ad hoc query? It, it seems like if you have to do the stored procedure that it's kind of more... Um... Yeah, you can perform ad hoc queries in bulk, but the system is really designed for workloads that are known in advance and that can be implemented through this procedure interface. So there's an interface you can, which we'll see that you can use and you can make arbitrary queries of the system, but the system is really uh, heavily designed towards applications that are middleware driven or, or application driven. Competing questions. You have to fight. To and the, the winner gets the book. Oh, <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, we advise people in production to use stored procedures for their production workload. So ad hoc is more for administrative or like, building an application. It's not quite, not to, is there a thing yet though from it? Yeah, so all of the ad hoc procedures in Volt that are currently exposed are exposed as multi-partition procedures, meaning that they're not the fast kind of partitionable workload. Did we um, not make that official? Yeah, well actually, we, if, yeah, if you know the magic words, you can execute single partition ad hoc, but we haven't really quite settled on a, on a UI for that, so we haven't documented that, but. So there's no yeah, hypothetically might be yeah. You were saying that reads are sent to all and writes are sent to all, but then you said for reconciliation that there's a leader node. How does uh, that leader the, node work? So there's a transaction manager at each node. So each node has a, a transaction manager with the capability of creating a transaction ID uh, and initiating a transaction in the system. That's also the node that has the TCP IP connection back to the client that initiated the transaction. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not particularly a leader in any global sense. It's just kind of a leader for that transaction, maybe, if you think of it that way. It's really just essentially receiving data off of the network I.O. subsystem, creating a transaction ID for it, uh, and managing the life cycle of that transaction should a failure occur on a node or... or so it just, because it just, um, it, it just becomes the leader because it came to there first and then it was propagated out to all the others? Yeah, I actually, um, I dislike the word leader for this. It's really oh. not unique in any way. It just happens Sorry. to be the node that the transaction was sent to by the client. Okay, I was just using the word that you do, so. Sorry. I, oh, I, I'm sure I misspoke. I didn't mean that in a, in a, I, I in a mean way at all. I, no, I don't. Okay. I, I think, I, yeah, it, it, it's all good, yes. we understand. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm not, okay. totally. <laughs> Although, if you explain it for another five minutes, I think they'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it's just, it's not a leader in, a, in any official way. It just happens to be the node that received the transaction invocation, that particular You said it's advantageous for the system to know kind of the queries in advance. Does that mean that they have to be there when the data comes in? Or that there's some long sort of recalculation when a new start procedure is put in? You can add and remove stored procedures to the system without uh, affecting the running application. So the, the procedures have, uh, there's, in VoltDB, there's essentially uh, uh, an application assembler. I don't know if you're familiar with web service -y kinds of things. Uh, they kind of work this way. So you, you define a set of stored procedures and a little bit of configuration. Uh, and then you build a jar file that contains all of the class files for those procedures, and you deploy that jar file onto the database. That jar file essentially represents your database application or your, your database metadata catalog, however you want to think of it. Uh, and so if you want to add a new procedure, you need to build and deploy a new catalog. Which I think is actually a, a great transition to the demo that Ning is going to give. Um, I totally failed to give out these books. Here. If you want us a peace offering. <laughs> <laughs> any, any, anyone else? You, you can't get around that meme. That's okay. 
Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. It's worth mentioning why the store procedure is emphasized. One of the reasons is it's not just the round trips. It's, um, the, the sequel, there's no semantic analysis, no planning. All that overhead is gone when you pre-compile everything. Uh, and you get to bind your arguments. Um, you don't have to do any um, te text to binary conversion or native data types, etc. Do you need to restart? Can you no, you don't need to restart to uh, update your procedures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a, it sounds like there's a whole deployment process for that. Are you able to deploy like one sort of procedure that dynamically invokes other Java code so you don't have to actually go through a deployment process? Is there, does that make sense? Um, so the stored procedure process, the class load, and all of that is tightly orchestrated so that yeah, things are updated atomically across the cluster. So uh, basically, like, you ship everything inside your, your jar file, and that's the code you can legitimately access. So I'm not sure it, anything extremely dynamic, um, especially loading external resources that might be on one node but not on another node is problematic because then how do you resolve that conflict? So um, I'd say that we have a deployment process uh, and you can update and add procedures uh, and then classes they depend on. Um, but doing that from within your store procedures, not so much. So thank you, Ryan, for uh, the presentation. So people say uh, demo is actually worth a thousand slides. Um, we actually made a thousand slides, but it's you know it's going to be a roller coaster experience for you guys if we present all of them in an hour. <coughs> um, so we made the demo. Um, I'll show how easy and quick it is to um, create a full project and then load data into the database. Um, and what interesting analysis they can do while the data is being imported. So here I have a directory called talk that includes a demo directory and a fault db-2.2.1 directory. I'm sorry, can you read the text on the screen? Okay. You can make it bigger, that one. contains the vault code. All of the vault code is actually inside this directory. Nothing, you don't have to install anything to the system. You can just um, untar it, uh, then you can use the, uh, you, you can use vault. So let's go into uh, the demo directory. For the demo, we have this data set. We download it from uh, New York State Department of uh, tra uh, Transportation that includes the uh, sensor traffic data um, from across the, from sensors across the state in the year 2008 and 2009, um, we have two CSV files: 08 data.csv and 09 data.csv. Each one, uh, one for each year. There are roughly 10 million lines in uh, each one of the files. So the data format. Let me show a quick example. Wider for now. So each line is uh, contains a traffic sensor record. Uh, the first column shows the sensor ID. The second column shows the uh, date of the uh, record. The third column is the hour of uh, of the record. Um, all these data are actually hourly traffic data. So um, you won't see any uh, minutes or seconds in the third column. And the fourth column is the direction of traffic. The fifth column is the, uh, the lane it reports. <coughs> and the last column is the uh, number of cars past the sensor in the hour. 
Um, so for this uh, demo, I actually pre-processed the data to contain the date column. Uh, it used to just contain the time column. <laughs> so to get started, uh, we need to define a schema that actually matches the data. Uh, instead of uh, typing here, I actually have already I've already typed in the schema here. It's actually very straightforward. Um, we have a table called traffic that will load all the data into, and uh, we have an index on the traffic table, uh, just in case we need to do some queries on the on the uh, traffic data. And then we have a view that's also on the traffic table um, that does the summarization on sensor ID and date. So it's very simple and straightforward. Um, let's look at um, so next we need a project file which actually tells people uh, where to find the schemas and uh, procedure files if you have any and uh, how you want to partition the table. The project file is a simple XML, XML file that just includes uh, these basic informations like the DDL location, uh, the, how we want to partition the traffic table, which we will partition on the sensor ID. And since we don't have any procedures now, um, there's no procedure elements in the uh, file. Now we're all set, we can create a catalog, which Ryan just mentioned. Um, it, a catalog is just a bundle of all the files that defines the, this, this project. And um, uh, FoldDB will just load the catalog file and immediately knows what application it's running. So to compile the catalog, we have a script inside the VoltDB directory called Volt Compiler. Um, the first argument is a, the directory that will look for the uh, procedure class box. Um, since we don't have any, the, the ops directory is, is actually empty. And the second argument is the project file. The third one is the output which we'll call traffic.jar. Right, so, uh, just finished. Um, so notice that uh, here, it shows that the compiler has created a traffic.insert procedure for us um, because we the traffic table is actually partitioned. Um, so the compiler will create some prod procedures for us so that we can easily uh, import data into the database. Uh, we'll use this procedure to load all the CSV, uh, to load all the data in the CSV file later. Now, uh, since Vault is a distributed database, we need to tell Vault how um, to deploy to different nodes. Um, for this demo, we only have one node, which is my <coughs> laptop. Uh, it's going to be a very simple deployment file. It describes the topology of the uh, network. Um, in this file, we tell Vault that this database will just have one node, so the host count is one, and size per host, meaning that we want to we want two partitions in the database. And the k vector is zero because I only have one node. If it's gone, then the database is gone. We don't have any more uh, replicas. So this is the deployment file. So what do we have so far? We have created a project file, we have a schema, and then we created a deployment file. With these three files, we can start Vault by passing the following arguments. So you didn't create stored procedures, they already existed for loading the data? So I didn't create any uh, stored procedures because for the first step, we only need to insert data into the table, um, and Vault compiler is smart enough to actually create a uh, to generate a uh, insert procedure for us, um, which we just saw here as the compiler in the compiler output, it automatically generated this procedure for us. Um, so we don't need to create one now, but I will show how to create a single pro uh, procedure later. So, uh, we'll call VoltDB script. This script will actually start VoltDB. Um, we pass it the leader node, which is localhost, and uh, catalog is traffic.jar. Deployment file is called deployment.xml. So, 
Well, it starts just so the leader node here is only used for establishing a cluster. So once the cluster topology is established, then the, the leader aspect goes away. It's right. just, it coordinates starting a cluster, basically. So you don't have to type the address of every single node. Mm -hmm. So now we have a whole database running. And um, um, so, uh, we have, we're working on a CSV loader um, that's, that will be a generic CSV loader that you can use to load, load your CSV file into Vault. Um, for the demo, we will use the uh, beta version of it. Uh, it's called, I have a script that will actually start the CSV loader, uh, which takes the CSV file and a stored procedure name, which will, uh, and then the CSV loader is going to call the procedure on each line of the uh, um, file. CSV loader has a, we're going to load the uh, data from 2008. Uh, the procedure name is called traffic.insert. All right, so now Vault is loading, uh, it's loading data into Vault. The CSV loader is actually a simple VoltDB client. It's written in Java. Uh, it just calls that traffic.insert procedure to load all the data into the database. And each row is being inserted as a single transaction. So while the data is loading, um, I'll show you a, a utility program we have in Flow that will allow you to execute SQL statements uh, as well as calling procedures on the command. Line. It's called SQL command. Um, since I'm running the database on localhost, I don't have to pass any arguments, I'll just start it. All right, say, I'm curious, I'm curious uh, which sensors have the heaviest traffic by day uh, in 2008. Let's start with a very simple query. Select, start from, see, remember that we have a view on the table that does the summarization, we just use that to do this query. It's called a uh, V traffic by sensor date. Uh, we're going to order by the count of this. Wait, it was too big. Just... By the count and in descending order, this limit 10. Let's see, top 10. So these are the top 10 sensors that have the highest traffic by day in that table. Um, it's weird that this sensor, 30291, actually showed up one, two, three, four, five, six times in a row in the top 10 list. Um, I'm curious if it's actually the, uh, the sensor or the row that had the heaviest traffic uh, by year to date in 2008. So let's do another query to find that out. Select. This time, we want to do some aggregation. So, put some on the count. The count is actually uh, by day, so if you're summing all of them, um, it's from uh, the beginning of 2008 until whenever the, the loader is up to. Uh, and we'll call it total count from the same view. And we're going to order by this new uh, column, total count here. The same order, the same limit 10. Oops. So, it's person I am. Ah. Group five. Yes. How can a demo go wrong, right? There we go. Hmm, it's not quite right. So 30291 is actually the last one on the list. And 50062 is actually twice the traffic as 30291. But 50062 only showed up once in the uh, heaviest traffic by day list. So let's think about it. Why 30291 showed up so many times in a row 
in the uh, heaviest traffic by day, but it only showed up as the last one in the uh, heaviest traffic uh, by year to date list. Um, so the still yes. loading? I'm sorry? Maybe because the data is not finished loading? The data is still loading. Right. So we're, maybe it was towards the beginning of the CSV file, it was more data regarding 30291. It could be that. Right. Or it could be that 30291 is, um, has a much lower average than 50062. So that uh, it means you know, 30291 just had some special event happening on those days. And that's just a rare event for 30291 to have such heavy traffic. But uh, 5062 um, is probably one of those main roads, so it has a uh, um, steady, heavy traffic th throughout the year. So both theories could be right. Um, so let's take a look at the average. Then we'll know um, what's actually uh, causing this. I'll change this query to, instead of using sum, I'll do an average. And uh, we're also showing the uh, highest, the top 10 list of the uh, heaviest traffic, average traffic in here. So um, 50062 showed up on the second, while 30291 doesn't even, is not even on the list. Um, I guess that it, it just means that 50062 is actually one of those main roads and it just has a uh, heavy, steady traffic flow um, throughout the year. Um, let's go back to the uh, first result for a second. Um, notice that the uh, all the rows of 30291 are actually, the date of those rows are actually pretty close together. 619, 620, 17, 18, 26, 25. Um, could be some events are happening around the sensor, you know, any wild guesses? Who's letting out the sun? Yeah, and that's one of the. Uh, uh, June 19th, summer's letting out. Ah. Uh, school's letting out. Uh, nice guess. So, uh, I actually don't know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, what I do know is, I was curious, I was curious about it this yesterday. So, I did a, a Google. It happened to be that the sensor is actually really close to the IKEA store. <laughs> <laughs> It could be some sales events <laughs> going on at the IKEA store. Um, <laughs> so um, we've seen how to do simple queries on whole. Um, a lot of people ask about stored procedures. Um, next, I will show how to write a uh, sim simple stored procedure. So imagine that we want to know we, we do care about roads which suddenly have heavy traffic on them. So we want alerts to um, notify us when a road has, suddenly has a uh, heavy traffic. Um, we can, what we should do it, uh, is to constantly query the database, which we just did, we want, uh, to query the database for the uh, heaviest traffic by day, that's or hour, or month, as you like. Um, but this is not very efficient, and it requires us uh, requires me to actually uh, re dedo the, the the list for the sensor the, the sensors that I, that I have seen before, um, and also it could the result could be a little bit out of date. So a better way to do it is to actually write your own stored procedures to alert immediately when the uh, the traffic on that road goes over a threshold. Uh, I have a procedure written here Let's take. that does exactly that. I call it insert.java. It's a Java file. It's pretty short. So what this procedure does, it starts, let's scroll down a little bit, too much. So what it does is actually it's, it takes the same arguments or parameters as the uh, traffic.insert procedure we've seen before. It's the same order as uh, we defined in the schema. Once, it had, once it's invo invoked, 
uh, it inserts the data into the traffic table as what we've seen before, but it also does a select, uh, it also gets the, it get the total for that day for that sensor from the view and check if the total is above the threshold. If it is above a threshold and we've never seen an alert for that sensor on that day, then we insert an alert into the alerts table, which we will create. So it's very simple, and the threshold we've set here is 200,000 cars in a single day. And if, uh, it, if the traffic goes over this threshold and we've never seen an alert for the sensor on that day before, then we return a 1, otherwise we return a 0 to the client, so that whenever this happens, we immediately get an alert by uh, checking the uh, return code of this procedure. Now we will create the table. The alert table. Let's go back to the DDL. I'll add it to the end of this file. Create table alerts. Want the sensor ID, which is an integer, and the record date. And the primary key, the primary key is going to be on both of these columns. Since we've added a new table, we also need to tell the project file that we also want this table to be partitioned on the sensor ID column. And now we have a stored procedure. We'll add a procedures node. <coughs> procedure we just created. Now we compile a second catalog by calling the compiler. Uh, I, forgot, I forgot one uh, step. We need to uh, compile the class file for that procedure first. So Java C and the class path will include both DB jar, which actually has the uh, procedure interface And we want the output to be in the ops directory. This is the procedure that we are compiling. There we go. Now we are all set to create the cal. Well, compiler. It's the same as before. Let's call it traffic to dot jar.
Now the database is still running here. Um, without restarting the database, we can actually update the catalog by using the command line utility that we just saw. And this time we'll call a different procedure. Uh, it's a system procedure written in Vault called update application catalog. And we pass the new catalog to it as well as the deployment file. Then it will update the catalog on the fly. Now the database has the new procedure and the new table. This time, we'll insert the data from year 2009, and we'll use this new procedure to automatically generate alerts for us. There you go. So instead of calling traffic.insert, we'll call insert and load it with the data from 2009. It's loading data. Let's take a look at the alerts table. There we go. It generated some alerts. And all these dates and sensors are um, have traffic by day over 20, 200,000 cars uh, in a day. And uh, if just in case, if you're curious about the uh, um, the last 10 alerts, you can always do alerts uh, order by record time, descending, and limit 10. This is how simple it is to uh, get some alerts going on. Since the CSV loader doesn't really check the results from the procedure, um, it's not going to show anything here. But if you have your own application, imagine you're streaming data and calling procedures, uh, you can immediately get the alert by checking the result, um, the return code from the procedure. and. Um, so with the queries that I just demonstrated and the stored procedure, imagine you have a web page that shows the heaviest traffic, the heaviest, the roads with the heaviest traffic by day or by hour. Um, this could come really handy. And um, so for the for the demo, um, what we've done is we created a very simple project with a uh, simple DDL project on an XML. XML file, a deployment file that describes just one node, and then a very simple stored procedure. This is how quickly and easily you can start Vault, load data into it, and play uh, doing real-time analysis while the data is firehosing in the database. Um, it's you can see the speed of uh, the uh, transactions in the in this screen. It's uh, it's only running on my laptop, so uh, you can see it's not really uh, fast, but it's actually going at tens of thousands per second. Um, that's all I have for this uh, demo. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yes? Some things that uh, in my presentation, that you have some data calculation in memory. So what is the in-memory part versus what is the uh, most common the storage? So the queries that I just demonstrated are all calculated in memory. Um, this is all I'm, happening in memory? Yes, this is all happening in memory. I didn't set a snapshot. I didn't set min logging in the deployment file. So it's not writing anything to disk. It's all in memory. Okay, and what if you talk over your laptop? <clears throat> so in this case, if I shut down the application or uh, shut down my laptop, all the data is gone. But if I want to run it for real, I would turn on snapshot or command logging or a combination of both. And how often does that write to the database? Is it asynchronous? It's as your own, your own choice. You can write the snapshot to the disk on an hourly basis or minutes or uh, something, any number you choose. And uh, command logging will just cover the, um, the point from the last snapshot to the current uh, time. So durability in Bolt is, is user configurable. If you're running in the default kind of mode that Ning has demonstrated on his laptop, it's all in memory. However, you can make the database uh, absolutely durable. You can, you can force every transaction to be F-synced before it's executed or returned to the user, and that writing is actually done in the replica. So you're producing 
you know, your replication factor number of right, copies of that data. Oh, group 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 group. Group. It's fast. Okay. But Except it's that it's, yeah, and it's written in a way that's quite yeah. performant because R is very clever. <laughs> but if I care about the data in the database, I can certainly do a manual snapshot now by calling the snapshot uh, save procedure and save all the state to disk and then shut down the database cleanly. So all these insertions now go to memory, there is nothing. It's all going into Why is kind of, it is, looks like sl slow, it's not, not fast. It, it's running on my laptop, only has two cores. So you're, how much memory do you got at what point? I mean, do you have a way of monitoring both and your operating system to what's running each? Um, so it's... crash <laughs> yeah. It's or would you just monitor it with like free and SAR and things like that? Um, you can monitor like that, or you can uh, call a stored procedure called system information statistics. or statistics, which will show you the uh, resident set size of uh, how much memory Vault is using. So, if you're having everything stored in memory on one of your nodes, how does it then get that information to propagate it to? Is it, is it pulling it from memory, or is it pulling it from somewhere else to propagate it to all the read nodes, to all the write Thank nodes? You. So, um, for uniformity, the data is sharded, so there are partitions, and partitions repli only have replicas, and so the replicas get all the writes, um, and so the disk is just used for persistence, and so there's no need to shift data around. There's no read nodes or write nodes. There's just every data that has a set of places where it's replicated. Um, and that's set by your k-factor. And k-factor is a... So in this case, it's zero. There's no because replicas. It's, because there's only one computer, and there's only one node in the database, and there's no... You cannot set a k-factor above zero. Because there's nowhere else to... Should right, exactly. Generally, you use that process of trying to keep track of your other memory So, so monitoring is up to you, um, and so it's half partitioning. So the, typically, you're not going to run into issues with with for as a workload, but you're not going to run into issues with nodes having uh, differing amounts of memory, like say range partitioning. Um, and if you want to resize your cluster, you can take a snapshot and then restore the snapshot with a larger cluster, um, and that will it will reshard for you. But. So, so memory is a is a resource to pull that needs to be monitored, just like you would monitor a disk-based system, right, for disk availability. <clears throat> it's just it's a resource the database requires, and you need an operational procedure to guarantee you have a sufficient amount of that resource. Mm -hmm. So once you get the upper limit, your host or what happens? Oh, once you hit the upper limit, the database will stop functioning. It can't store any more data in memory, uh, and you have the data that was made durable through the command logging system so that you can deploy to a larger cluster and start processing again. So you have to store like one multiple snapshot in order to have a large depo uh, repository? No, when you restore a set of snapshots to a new cluster, as the cluster restores that data, it will redistribute it for you. When you say a set of snapshots, does that um, mean that it's yeah, Taking a snapshot of all the a snapshot is just nodes? many files. There's files on each node. So when I said a set, I just meant the the number of files that comprise a single a, a single snapshot. Okay. okay. It seems like we're all stuck on the same point. So let me try to see if I uh, I understand this in a very simplistic way. You keep saying that all the data is on every node. And you say you can shard it over so No, no. So that's where. I, but that's so if where I said that all data is on every node, I, I didn't. That's not at all what I intend. Every node, I, I don't. I hope I didn't say that. At any rate. So every every node has a subset of the data. So there's a number of partitions in the system, and every node has replicas of a subset of the partitions. In the case of the example of on Ning's case, there's one node, and so it has all of the data. I'm going to have to go watch the video now and see where I said each data has each node has all the data. I was just wondering, does that mean that at startup it loads everything that's been persisted into memory or does it on demand? 
Um, you can choose to start cleanly, or you can choose to. So if you persist, it. Yes, it will restore everything on from this to memory again. Would you mind just running that statistics command you mentioned sure. to show us what the output looks like? Yeah. It's showing the, uh, the resident set size. It should use a little bit over a gig. Are there, are there formulas that you suggest for, you know, like when they're saying, you know, DB buffer pool, over 70% of your, you know, excess of your total available memory. For here, do you have sort of a formulaic equation of like what? Close to your what your seven. resident set size should not be over with respect to so there's a reallocated? There's a sizing spreadsheet. They've given a schema. Uh, we'll tell you essentially how many bytes we expect each row to take in a table and in, and in the indexes that are defined. Okay. So you can, there's some sizing guides. So we test up to like 95% RSS and we expect we to be able to go right up to the edge of the with the largest sizes you've seen? So we have customers with um, 256 gigabytes per node. Yeah, that's, the, that's the largest. Uh, yes. Heap. What about off heap memory? So heap two, we don't store data on the Java heap. Um, we store data. We have a native library and a oh. native execution engine um, that stores the data. And so we can do our own memory management there. Um, so the Java heap is smaller. It's you know, 512 megabytes. Um, and the biggest we've seen is 206 gigabytes, that's, that's about what you can stuff in a box conveniently. So normal people would just run with uh, one gig of Java heap on each node uh, as the default and set. So it's um, the stored procedure language is, is in Java, um, so we can host user stored procedures in a virtual machine, and it's real reasonably safe. Um, and then the for the native execution, so when you batch up SQL statements in your stored procedure um, to either insert data or query data, um, that goes through JNI to a C++ library where all the data is stored. Uh, and so the networking and transaction coordination, the actual stored procedures themselves, are run in Java. So, so, where it pays, yeah. So, like, is there? I, I realize this is a. Is this an engine that replaces, or works alongside, like, an ODB? No, it's. Um, so it's a it's a separate engine, and we think often for a separate purpose. So, okay. it, like in the in the data pipeline slide I had, you know, we think that there's a case for consumption of data near its origin. You need to consume data in an unmatched way, right? A, a lot of small write transactions. Uh, so we think that it's a system that kind of can play there, and that then can offload data for analytics. Right? You're clearly not going to store your full analytic history in memory. That would be infeasible. So. If we think that you need really to choose your, the right data management tool for the particular problem you're solving. You know, there's use cases I think that Bold is very good at, and there's use cases that analytic systems are very good at. So are there any parameters that, that come along with this engine that need to be set to be read into the layers of configuration when the database starts up? Um, yeah, so you can configure uh, how many, essentially, how many partition replicas there are per host. So each, each part, each replica, each site uh, commands a thread or ideally a core. So you can, you can size that to the size of your hardware. Uh, you can size some of the, the FSync frequencies for essentially the group commits for command logging. Um, there's a number of, of things that you can size, but uh, it's not it's not overly complex, and certainly the configuration space in Vol is minuscule in comparison to like a, an older database of MySQL or Postgres, where there's a, a longer history of development and options. And it looks like it's mostly XML file driven. Is that how you guys are? Yeah, our config is expressed mostly through XML. Okay. 
Okay. So for specifically for the kind of problems I want to solve, just so I understand this, I take the volume of data that I have. It can automatically be sharded across multiple servers. Mm -hmm. But to figure out how many servers I need, I have to sum up the amount of memory on each. Well, so each each shard has to fit in memory. To see. So there are problems that are, are space limited. So where you might you might calculate the size of your cluster based on how much storage you require, and there are problems that are are throughput constrained, right? So you might calculate the number of nodes that you require based on the number of transactions that are coming in, right? So there are very 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 high velocity applications, right? Very high frequency transactions against a smaller state. And then there are also the inverse. There's a whole spectrum in between, right? So uh, you need to look at your problem and, and kind of those two axes and pick a scale accordingly. Right. Well, the problem that I have is I need all the data available all the time because it's going to be, in many cases, driven by a website where any query can be. Right. Run against so that's more of a, an ad hoc analytic workload, and it's a little bit different from workloads that we've built before. I mean, if you really need all of the data, if you need to store all the tweets from now until forever, and you want to query them arbitrarily, then then that's not a workload where you're trying to do a, a relatively uh, fixed threshold processing or, or ingestion against a stream. Right. Also, I think you're not going to store all those tweets once. You're probably going to end up having some processing you do on the closer to real time stuff. There's going to be longer term roll ups. You'll be presenting. There's the point queries you'll be doing. You know, people want to look at a specific thing way back two years ago, and so you have a different storage engine for each. You probably won't end up storing once. Um, and the other thing is on the on the idea of ch multiple cheap machines. Um, the prices I can see, I can get on um, Rackspace. I can get a cheap cloud server, um, meaning twenty dollars, thirty dollars a month, with like a gig. Mm -hmm. um, of memory. If I want to get close to 30 gigs, 32 gigs, Rackspace just, they're way priced beyond. Yeah, and memory in the cloud is kind of expensive. I, I can get a dedicated machine with 32 gigs for $450, yeah. month, which isn't cheap if I need five to ten of them. Yeah. So, again, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what I have. I mean, I understand there are, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, there are problems. No. But you, if I, what I need to do is take the, the, the fire hose of the pipe of all tweets going by mm -hmm. and process them on the fly and only do analytics on that, yeah. that's one problem. So I'm wondering whether my problem fits. Um, I still need to think of myself as being memory constrained so you and can, therefore cost per node yeah. constrained. Um, so it, it would be relatively cheap to build a bulk cluster that could read the tweet stream and do some set of aggregation against it, but not store the whole stream. Right. You would either let the stream flow through Volt and store it elsewhere, or you would tee it before it got to Volt, right, and, and make your analytics store, you know, something more disk based. But uh, to store even Twitter, like to, to process Twitter's volume of incoming data, um, like each each node in Volt really can do, you know, tens of thousands of transactions, and Twitter at peak is like still, I think, less than I forget. I think it's still over 200,000 transactions a second, even if it Close, but it's been a long time since I've worked, so I'm pretty way off. And to be fair, there are multiple parts of the problem. Yeah. And this might solve one piece of the problem, and then some other right. long term store that's slower might solve other problems. And well, you can quite yeah. tell the point these are going to be fast queries, these are going to be slow queries, and that's like. Or frequent and less frequent. Right. right. Okay. Because there's some really fast uh, analytic storage engines. I mean, Considering how much data processing you're doing, they're really, really fast, actually. So. You guys have a do integration. Do we? Do we? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, a lot of the talk here has been about how it will fit in memory, but and as Ryan's slide uh, pointed out, we, we fit sort of in the ingestion side of it. Mm -hmm. um, you need to manage your memory, how much you're storing, and you provide an export facility, so you can export to Hadoop. We have a through Scoop or um, to a flat file, we include an export for that. Um, and we publish the protocol, and you can build your own export client to, to export whatever type of analytics system you'd like. So you can uh, be like a front end sort of cache to some of the data? Yeah, if you, if you think of the time value of data, like the, the 
if you're Wall Street, you care about the data that happens in the last five minutes or last second or microsecond. And you might be querying or dashboarding that, and then after the three days, let's say that you know the, the trading window for settling, you might push that to a vertica or a do for deeper analytics, at, you know, historical mining. And so we, we sit in the front end where the data is more timely, it's probably more valuable, and that's where you, you're doing your, your rapid ingestion and, and leaderboarding, if you will. So, so I think integrating Vault with other storage systems are really actually exciting. <coughs> it's also really interesting to learn about. So if people have uh, use cases or thoughts and that kind of thing, we're always willing to, to listen. We have a lot of ideas on that from sort of real-time export to more kind of on-demand pull from the database to perhaps you know snapshot to HDFS. That I mean, there's all kinds of cool things that we could do on that front. We're always interested in hearing people's thoughts on that. So we talk to a lot of people about especially the you know, streaming aspect of their data. It's always fun to talk to people on the other side of that problem, too. It's, we'll have thoughts or want to catch us some time. All right. So uh, thank you for answering my traffic questions. So in case this for the rest of us. Don't despair. I have seven more books that we can give away at future meetings. So figure three each time, and then one left over, we'll figure it out. Well, thank you so much for the demo. You're welcome. And thank you.